I could not introduce myself because I'm uh, chairing and I'm also the first speaker. Uh, it's, it's, if I were the last one, I could take more time, but there is another. Okay. I'm very grateful to the organizers, you know, Tal, uh, Sam, and uh, Gabby for inviting me to that very interesting symposium. And especially as this is my first visit uh, to Israel. I'm going to talk today about uh, preferential flow. And when you talk about preferential flow, we all know, you say, oh, it flows through cracks, which is an extremely important process. And uh, for instance, cards is the limit, you know, with big flow in uh, limestone and things like that. What I'm going to look at is the other limit in which you have preferential flow in perfectly homogeneous or as homogeneous as you wish uh, soils, but they have to be coarse sands. So it's somewhat limited to coarse sands. But when you have that uh, process, then it's very important, especially in uh, arid regions. And uh, as John Selker introduced the topic uh, five minutes ago, and that has been going on for about maybe 40 years or maybe even more, and people are constantly going back on it and rediscovering things, formulating things in a different way. And what I'm going to try to do is give you a very quick uh, historical uh, survey of uh, what has happened, how it developed, what we roughly know, and what are the questions that are still a bit unknown. Okay? And uh, so this is the first experiment, as far as I know, uh, looking at it. In that experiment, I'll describe it very briefly, uh, you have a, a fine soil on top, and then underneath, the water is not moving nicely down into that very homogeneous coarse sand, but you get columns. Right? We used to, well, I'll go back on the nomenclature later. But you get those columns that are roughly that size, go to the bottom, and stay like that, at infinitum if you keep running the experiment. So you can see if you have, for instance, a, an aquifer made up of a coarse sand and the water will recharge the ground table much faster than you might expect, which is very good. On the other hand, if, of course, the water is polluted, then you will pollute the uh, groundwater much quicker than you would expect. Or if you had a fertilizer and expect the plants will pick them up, no it will bypass the roots and go to the bottom. Uh, this is also very important if you want to irrigate, say for instance, uh, sand dunes that are moving, that you inject water and then you find the, 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 that column of water will go say to the center of the dune, away from the surface where the water would evaporate and then you can grow plants and the roots will go inside and fix the dune. So there are pluses and minuses in that process, but the main thing is that you can get a situation in which you have a dry sand and a column of water bypassing most of the matrix, which in a certain sense you can see, keep in mind the analogy with cracks. There is lots of analogies. Now, and speaking of analogies, people have constantly tried to uh, see simpler system where you have similar situations. This one, it's a, a column. Here it's glass, and here it will be an acrylic uh, column, some plastic. And you have oil and water. What you get is a similar situation, but there are two things that I want to introduce at this stage, is that the importance of the walls, contact angles, will come out. Here, it's the water that's falling down into the oil, and uh, because the oil wets the walls. Here, on the contrary, it's the oil that goes up in the water because the water wets the walls. Otherwise, it's the same thing, but totally different situation depending on the contact angle. And uh, the, that process also leads us to what happens in what I'm going to discuss because it's somewhat similar. Uh, it predicts the velocity of those, they are called slugs. G.I. Taylor, of course, studied them a long time ago. And uh, 
the velocity depends on gravity, of course the radius of the tube comes in, and it depends on the surface tension, which is quite obvious. But notice viscosity is not here. I'm looking at a case in which the tubes are large enough that in fact viscosity is irrelevant, which is going to turn out in our case as well. And notice also that as gravity increases, of course the velocity increases, but as the surface tension increases, because of the minus sign, the velocity will decrease. So that surface tension, in general, is going to be stabilizing and gravity is destabilizing. Now, this is another analogy which is very important to make us think, but is misleading for our case. And yet, people have it in mind because, again, that experiment is due to Safman and Taylor. And of course, you know, whatever G.I. Taylor has done, everybody reads very carefully <laughs> for good reasons. And what it is here, the differences are, it doesn't look like columns, okay? It looks more like toes or fingers, and that's where the word fingering comes. Ours are not fingers, they really are columns. These are more, so, People call them fingering, and the idea is that it looks like a hand going up. What it means is that the fingers merge together in the palm of your hand. The columns did not merge together as they might, you think. And what comes in is that in our case, hysteresis is very important, and that's what prevents the merger. Didn't exist here. This is an experiment in a Haley-Shaw cell and uh, viscosity also comes in. They are displacing very viscous uh, liquids. Okay. So you have to keep that in mind because it has misled quite a few people. Now this is another, oh boy, it's almost impossible to see, but anyway, never mind. This is something, again, for those of you that remember uh, cracks, things that have happened, this is very similar. You have those columns that are moving. It's a bit of a mess. And you can see it's uh, pink at the bottom, and the columns moving down are blue. And there is, of course, a bit of water between the column. And the dye, blue dye or pink dye, diffuses slowly outwards until you see a pale blue in between. And as it goes in, the pink that was there before is diffusing back, just molecular diffusion, is diffusing back into the column and going to the bottom. So this is something which is very important. The fact that the, the water column goes down quickly and leaves uh, essentially the matrix on the side does mean that it interacts with it. And, and some of you that are old enough may remember the, when the Soviet Union were doing a nuclear explosion in the atmospheres. And the people in England that I knew were all excited at the time because they say now we are going to get good tracers and we'll be able to see what happened in the carts uh, near Dover, you know, in the limestone. And to their horror or surprise, nothing arrived in the groundwater for many years because, of course, the, 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 the limestone on the side was free of, new, of these uh, uh, tracers, so they all diffused in until there was enough that it was essentially saturated and they could reach the bottom. This is an extremely important. People have noticed that for an experiment with nitrates, uh, say uh, using uh, natural isotope, and they find that they grow corn, you know, in the spring and so on. Then uh, the fall comes, the winter and so on. And the snow arrives, melts again the next time, and surprise, they get some nitrate going down. Where does it come from? That was the one that was hiding on the side. So they are very important for that purpose. That's your slide, isn't it? Yeah. That, uh, well, John Selker gave me that slide. It's a very nice slide. It was uh, uh, in Florida, I believe. Correct me when I'm wrong. And it was, uh, they, they were opening a new road, and they made a cut through a dune. And you see, th this is some uh, iron oxide that was there, presumably to the top. And over the, the years and the years of those fingers forming, or columns, you see, I fall in the old pattern, the, the iron oxide goes into the, 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 the column of water, 
and if, until on the top there is no iron oxide left and you can see the process is going on here. Eventually they'll go to the bottom and there will be no iron oxide left, but it takes a long time. That's uh, the first field experiment and uh, you can see they, again uh, they, they drove a caisson in, uh, into the ground with a vibrating uh, hammer until it went into the uh, groundwater and then after that they, they remove the soil, actually we say we, I was one of those handling the shovel, and, and uh, in the top soil, which was the fine soil layer in the first slide, you have more or less the dye all over the place, and then as you dig deeper, most of the matrix is free of that salt, uh, uh, that green dye, and you see the, the column, the traces of the small columns forming inside. As far as I know, that's the first. I should be careful. Uh, since, of course, this process started to be studied, people have looked in literature and there have been field geologists who have observed them and, and mentioned them, but, you know, nobody ever read it or understood what they had. And, and in fact, uh, the, the one in Australia by the name of Bond was maybe a very good observer of what's happening, called them uh, columns, and he was absolutely right. They are columns. Now, if you make a trace of the green spot I showed you, that's an important slide because you can see there are some big ones and there are some small ones. And it's one of the paradox of the process is that you might think all the big ones, that's the ones that count and the small ones are really largely irrelevant. No, it's of course exactly the opposite because the fingers are not stupid. They want to go as fast as they can out of the sand, so they tend naturally, you know, randomness or whatever, to go in that part of the sand where it, there are more micropores. It's a bit, even though it's very homogeneous, it's not entirely homogeneous. And so you go, you can see, you go almost toward a crack if there was a crack, it would go even faster if it was saturated, which it is not. But the small ones carry most of the dye. The big ones, in fact, none of them reached the groundwater when the experiment was over. And, uh, of course, we took the sand, washed it, homogenized it, and redid the experiment in the lab. And in the lab, the, the columns we observed were the big size. Okay, so this one were the exceptional sizes in a sense, picking up the biggest uh, grains in the, and that of course is in the groundwater, you cannot see, but anyway, there was only one spot that was very green, everybody was relatively the usual uh, dirty color. Okay, I'm not going to go through the algebra because that would be boring, I just want to give you the, the a very crude framework of the very crude answers we can give and we can trust and we will see the results make uh, perfect sense. So we are going to solve a problem which when you look at it has nothing to do with what I am discussing but you will see there is some analogy. Uh, let's, let's assume that you don't have instability so the, the, the movement will be say flat, huh? it will be the the standard uh, thing in a homogeneous uh, sand, and then you are going to do, say, suppose you have a little disturbance somewhere, and so you do a Fourier analysis, no usual thing, you know, the, you linearize, you look at a small perturbation, and there it is with the wave number and the frequency. You solve, uh, here you say, oh, there is a region where the water content is going to be constant, everything is constant, and then in front of that, that would be, say, the line spot where you have that pressure, and in front there would be a, a drying front, okay? And, and I'll go back on that quite a bit because we don't try to study that drying front. It's essentially impossible. I'll explain to you later on. So you want to look just at that part. So here you solve the, 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 the Richard's equation reduces to uh, essentially Laplace's equation, in which you, this is the pressure and that's the gravity effect. That's the surface tension effect and that's the gravity effect. And this is the flux, that's Darcy's law, 
and, and the difference between the velocity of the fluid and the velocity of uh, the, 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 that line, let's call it U, uh, means that the line, that line is moving. If this is greater than that, it's going in this direction and vice versa. So that is all very, so I repeat that equation. And then this would be, this is essentially the flux, namely that's the velocity you would have if there was no instability. And this is the velocity you have when the, the instability develops. The two are different. Now you, and this is the subtivity, namely it's the surface tension effect. And this is the curvature. That's just straightforward. And then you take that equation, so you use that one to eliminate U, you lose that, you use that one, and you use Darcy's law to uh, eliminate V, okay? And you end up with that equation. See, that's the dz dt of, the, of that equation. This one is this term. You can see them all. They are all here. So that's the boundary condition at the end of your uh, Laplace's equation. You can integrate term by term. It's quite trivial. And you get that equation. You can simplify by z, and you end up with a relationship. Uh, you end up with a dispersion relation between the wave number and the frequency. Then, of course, it's clear. Uh, you may have all the frequency present, but the one that moves the fastest uh, is going to eat the other column. So uh, you end up with another column. So we ask which one goes the fastest, and that's the important result. It tells you that that wavelength, or half the wavelengths, which could be the order of the column, is proportional to sigma. Namely, the larger the surface tension is, the wider it is going to be. And in the denominator, there are two terms. You could remove Kf, put it outside. So you get S squared over Kf. They are so structured that each one of them is inversely proportional to viscosity. So when you make the ratio, the viscosity disappears. Of course, the viscosity then appears here when you divide by Kf. This, and and uh, for the, uh, the process that I'm talking about to be important, you want very few columns in nature bypassing most of the soil matrix. That's when they are important. If they are everywhere and they are very big, it's practically a one-dimensional flow. So you want very few. And so that you want, and, and when this increases, the, the wavelength is going to increase. The size of the column is going to increase. And uh, so you want this term to disappear. Namely, you want that term, which is to be much greater than this one, so that at the end, the viscosity disappears. And that's what happens when what I'm talking about is important. By the way, that equation has been uh, checked even with that term to see how it increases. It has been checked with limits, and I'm not going to go into that. Now these are, oh boy, I wish that one was clear, but anyway. This is a may, way more careful experiment that was carried, oh, I should mention, most of those experiments were not done by me. They were done by, uh, in uh, Tamus Tinus lab at Cornell, who was a, a great colleague, and uh, you know, PhD students, postdoc, and so on. I won't mention, mention their name. Because there will be too many, so, but I, I can assure you there are lots of people that did the work. Okay? I just talk about it. And, and uh, so this is like in the first slide, that fine layer of soil. This is a very coarse one, but now you can see what's going on in detail because it's very carefully done. And you see there are lots and lots of embryonic uh, uh, fingers, you could say, or whatever you want to call them, that are going on very regularly at the interface. What's the role of that uh, fine layer on top? First, of course, it's very often the case that that's what you have, is that's the plow pan, you know, whatever, in uh, nature, so they are important, but there are cases in which, in fact, you don't have that, you know, like sand dune. It's just the sand uh, going on on the outside. And actually, John Selker showed uh, in a very important experiment that th this is important to fix the point of entries, but you still get these columns without it, okay? But this, you can repeat experiments when you have that. It's, they, 
the points of entry are fixed. And uh, uh, the, the discussion of what goes on in the point of entries is a very important topic, which I won't go into. Uh, Dan Hillel, uh, I forgot where he was at the time, do you remember? But anyway, he wrote, uh, that's it, in Amherst, wrote quite a few uh, papers on it with his collaborators that are very interesting. Now, do you remember that width of the column that I uh, determined more or less are much bigger than this. So those little things have to merge. And they do merge, you can see what they do, until at the end, uh, you cannot see the details, unfortunately. Now, this is false coloring, and so the red means wet, and then you dry as you go up, okay? You, you can see that. In fact, uh, I think Danny Orr did experiment with drops and cracks, and there are lots of analogies. You can see lots of uh, things going on. And, uh, then you can go on and then you, you stop the experiment and the, the, they, dra they drain. And of course, you can start again. Boy, it's very hard to see, but from where I am anyway. But you start the experiment again and if you look carefully, the point of entries are always the same. There are obviously some weak spot at the contact between the top and the bottom. And, and when it moves, maybe you can see the things are more blurry. I mean, if it looks very blurry, it's not just a lack of light, it's more blurry. The columns widen and they are less wet. That's what I told you in the field experiment. When they widen, they become drier and they, are, they carry less material. Now, this is a very important experiment uh, that shows the hysteretic effect. I told you the hysteresis, it comes in uh, uh, two ways namely to prevent the widening of, uh, of the columns, but also uh, th that uh, it, it expresses that drying effect when you repeat the experiment. So the first experiment, when the soil was dry, by the way, that's the pressure with versus the water content, and uh, so you, that's what is called, of course, the, the drying curve. So that's what you observe above that, uh, the, the entry point, okay? That's when it is very wet and dries behind. This is the, the wetting curve when you start again, and then you dry the second experiment, it's here, and it is drier. See, that's the wettest part of the second experiment. It was drier than it is here. These curves, of course, you recognize at once, is, represent hysteresis. And you want to predict the hysteretic aspect from the first drying curve. Notice that the waiting curve, where they all start, is a theoretical line, because you cannot measure things. It's, again, maybe the major problem with what I am talking about, those uh, wet bulbs as they come down, the transition from the dry zone to the wet takes place in, in a column, in a couple of uh, pores, roughly. It goes extremely quickly, which means you cannot measure anything. If you want to use a tensiometer, say on a Darcy scale, more or less, it takes, you, ne you need more space to make the measurement. So it would be silly, it, this means nothing. It's only theoretical. And this line, by the way, is predicted from this one. It's a theoret theoretical prediction. All hysteric, hysteretic models to be useful in the field should be based predicting everything on the drying curve. It's tempting to try to do an interpolation if you know the two boundaries, but it's often very difficult to measure the waiting part. So you want to, and you can predict it, then knowing this one, we can predict all of those and that, okay? And the, the, the second point, which is very important, is uh, when I presented roughly the, the theoretical framework, remember I say I'm not going to look indeed at what goes on in front. How, how do you go from the dry to the wet? Because it goes too fast. Richard's equation, which is basically what we use, wouldn't apply in that part. People have tried to improve, you know, the theory, 
by extending a pseudo Richards equation to apply in over that couple of uh, uh, poles. But you can see it's, it, it's, it's not very meaningful. Richards equation is already a second order derivative come in. If you introduce higher order derivatives, you may fit the data, but how can you calculate derivatives second or third order on something which is a couple of poles? Richard's equation doesn't apply, period. And in fact, is more complex than that. I'll show you in a minute. To apply Richard's equation, you need equilibrium. Darcy's law applies when you have an equilibrium. You have no equilibrium in front. It's only behind that you have equilibrium because there is more space, more time. So that part, you should be able to predict. But you cannot predict where it starts. Again, because you would have to understand what's going on in the wetting process. And basically, we don't understand it very well. I'll go back on that. The, uh, the uh, columns very quickly move at a constant speed. That's what that represents, which means that uh, that again is actually John Selker's work. Uh, in the part when you look at the drying behind the, the waiting front, you can still use Richard's equation, so you see the second derivative, and then you can use for a traveling wave solution. So the, the usual thing, the position minus that constant velocity multiplied by t, which means from the PDE you end up with an ODE, and which means that if you measure the pressure as a function of time at a given point and your column goes through it, from it in one clean sweep, you can measure the soil water conductivity. That's in passing. It has some interest. That again is, well, actually his name is there. That's John Selker's e experiment. He had uh, two tensiometers, one just under the interface and one further down. And, and that's the prediction based on that ODE. In there, we assume, or we, we know the conductivity, so we can uh, predict the pressure as a function of time. And that's what he observes. Here, that's when uh, the water under the interface is catching up uh, with the tensiometer, so the measurement stops. And here, that's when uh, the column hits the bottom. So, of course, it stops the process. But you can see it works extremely well. That equation describes what's going on. Now, th this is actually a slide that means only one thing, is that the, those data are meaningless. Okay? And, and uh, it's trying to measure uh, the pressure in the waiting part. And uh, that's in the days when Cornell had a nuclear reactor. So you could get very powerful beams, very small columnae, so you could uh, shine them through the uh, system and measure the water content. Then you say, oh, I know Darcy's law, which doesn't apply, that's what I'm trying to say, but if you use it, then from that equation you can predict what the pressure is. And, and it's, very, it's measuring things at the pore size, so you measure things within the pore. And if you remember the weighting curves that I had earlier, it didn't look like that at all, okay? Remember, it was a straight line going down quickly. And here on there, that's the way it is. That's what you deduce, okay, from Darcy's law. And look here, the, the d, dh d theta is negative, h is negative. So dh d theta negatives is d is kda. It would mean that the diffusivity of the soil water is negative, which is, of course, absurd, which means you cannot use equilibrium concept in that region. So everything that uses uh, an equilibrium concept is wrong. We started, uh, what, how long do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes, thank you. I'll go very quickly. <laughs> well, you are sharing, it's, it's, it's a conflict of interest. <laughs> What, what I believe is most likely the explanation of what's going on in that waiting part is, is, uh, um, is uh, say, if you look at the waiting, just the waiting part as it goes through with a microscope, it's very interesting. 
the water is not moving uniformly down, as you may imagine from, say, the equations you, you conceive. It's not the front is moving uniformly down. For those of you that have seen uh, Heinz jump, that's what it looks. You look at it, and you see the water is popping down, puck, puck, you know, just step by step. It moves by step down. It's not uniform at all. And what it means, which is very important, is that when, where it pops, one or two maybe at a time, but not more. It's, it, it goes very quickly, but they are all different. It means that when it goes through the necks of the pores at that particular, the velocity is very high. It's not the average velocity of the water in the column that, co that counts. It's the velocity in that particular neck for the whole flow. And as a result of it, you may have velocities that go maybe 10 centimeters per second. It's something important, which means that the capillary number, you know, which is mu v over sigma, mu, the, the viscosity for a fluid, given fluid is, is fixed, sigma is fixed. The only thing that will affect the capillary number is the velocity. And so if you are in the 10, say, to 30 uh, centimeter per second velocity, you are, say, in that region. And you can see that, well, I should show the, ne the next slide because it's, I won't explain how you go from one to the other. It doesn't matter. Uh, the, uh, the contact angle is not the static contact angle. It is, in fact, more like 90 degrees, which means as the water goes through the neck, it doesn't wet. It becomes, in fact, non-wetting on the grain. And as a result of it, if it's, say, a flat, uh, if it is 90 degrees, it's a flat front, so that the pressure behind is, in fact, zero, which is more or less what you observe. I'll stop here. I have more slides, but uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Maybe a time for one question. I'm, now I'm the chair. I have one question. No question? Yes, sir. If you repeat the same case of the fingering test uh, again and again, how much, to, to what extent do you get uh, deterministic result? In other words, how much uh, stochastic you get? Uh, I, I'm not sure I, I quite understand the question, but let me, ex let me show you something. In this experiment, okay, in which the experiment was repeated time and time again, and eventually, uh, this is the, 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 li the last one. If you repeat the experiment, you go this way, clack, clack, clack. These are the scanning curves, okay? Eventually, it stops, stabilizes. So you see the finger or the column is still fairly wet, but it's far from saturation. And then this basically is the water content between the, uh, between the columns. Yeah. Maybe I could jump in for a second? Uh, please. Okay, so um, it, the, 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 the locations in a completely dry initial column are completely stochastic. So you will, each time you pack the chamber perfectly, you get fingers in completely different locations. And the only way to erase those locations is to either fully dry the column or fully saturate it. Otherwise, hysteresis, as Eve showed, would contain them in those locations as they were first established. Yeah. Is that what you're asking? Okay, okay. Yeah. okay. yeah, yeah. They stay in the same position. Okay, that is very, that's very important. That's why you can repeat the experiment. In, in fact, if you don't have the top uh, soil layer, that will be, uh, could be different. See, I think the, the top soil layer really fixes the points of entry. Okay. okay. Uh, well, next.